I wrote two posts in the last few days about problem solving while reading, and I think they have some pretty important ideas in them, so I'm going to chat about them a bit. They're on Curie blog because they're a bit casual in their writing style and disorganized and written quickly. But as far as the content and ideas go, I think they're completely worthy of the Critical Fallibilism site. I might write about the same topic again and try to make the writing nicer and put it on the CF site. That would be a good thing to do, but I have lots of good things to do, so it may or may not happen. There's not much in the way of new ideas in them, from my perspective. But it's talking about and applying some of the concepts I've written about before in ways that I think a lot of people probably don't understand, so I think it will be new to some of my readers. At least parts of it will seem new to them. I was trying to take some existing perspective that I've had for a while and write about it and apply it to a specific case. So the basic idea was people find reading hard. Someone mentioned finding it harder to read Popper than Rand, and several other people agreed with that. And I think that they didn't realize that there's a problem there. If you're finding Popper harder to read, that means your subconscious automizations are failing and making mistakes when they read the Popper stuff. There's something wrong there. So you can put some of the blame on Popper. I do think that Rand was a clearer, easier writer, but you have a problem and you can improve. You can increase your skills. You shouldn't just blame Popper or treat it as inevitable that you find it difficult. I talked about options like stopping when you get to a hard part or stopping every section or chunk and then going back through the hard parts to do analysis. And there are potential downsides, like people don't like having their reading disrupted in the middle in order to do analysis. They lose flow and they find it less fun or something. Which should lead to some questions about your psychology and motivations. Why is reading something hard a priority for you? Well, trying to improve your reading skill is less of a priority, less fun. If improving your reading skill was more important in your mind, then when you found a hard part, you'd be like, ooh, I have an opportunity to do an even better activity working on my reading skill. So you'd want to switch activities to the higher priority one. If you don't want to switch activities, that means you see it as lower priority. So I had some thoughts about why people don't like trying to improve their skills. One is they see it as child stuff, which is basically a misconception. As a child in school, you learn skills like reading to a certain standard or skill level or quality level. And the thing people need now is not to reach that skill level from childhood, it is to reach a higher skill level that is not normal to reach during childhood. So it's to do something more advanced, even though it is related to basic skills. Learning those basic skills to a higher level of precision or accuracy or quality or whatever is a new, more advanced thing, not the same thing that little kids are doing. One of the things that confuses that is people do sometimes, occasionally, make some of the same errors that little kids make, so then they feel bad and they feel like they're just trying to catch up to little kids or what little kids are supposed to learn or something, and they don't like that. But little kids make plenty of mistakes too. So if your error rate is 1% and the little kids are at 10%, but you do make some of the same mistakes as them, but less often, then you are better than them. Higher skill. And then what you can do now is try to get that 1% error rate down to 0.0001%, which will make it really, really reliable and enable advanced philosophy, whereas when it's at 1%, that's actually too high for advanced philosophy. Anyway, reviewing like childish skills, basic skills, and learning them to a more advanced, sophisticated, precise level is not childish. It is not what is expected of children in school. It is not what their goal is. It is a different thing that can help enable really smart stuff. 
another reason that people do not like to work on skills and try to improve is that they're stuck, they're bad at making progress. And another reason is when they try to do reading in a more conscious way and more explicit way, they're bad at it. So their skill level actually goes down. Their conscious reading is worse than their subconscious or intuitive or automated reading. And so they don't like to get worse at something as part of a path to making progress. They want to only get better and better and better with nothing ever getting temporarily worse. This is related to the issue people sometimes have where their intuition gets something right, but then if they do conscious analysis and overthink it, they end up getting confused and getting it wrong. When that happens to someone, it shows that their intuition is actually in some ways better at it than their conscious effort. And so the same thing can happen with reading where they start overanalyzing, overthinking, and getting more wrong answers than if they just read it in a more natural intuitive way. So if your goal is the local optima of short-term correct answers about your reading, you might be better off just using your intuition and your subconscious in your normal way. But if your goal is to actually make progress and get significantly better at reading, then you need to work on learning. And to do that, in general, the most effective way is to figure out consciously how to do things better and then practice that and teach it to your subconscious. So to do that, you have to take your conscious reading skills that are actually worse than your subconscious skills and catch them up to your subconscious skills and then get them more advanced than your subconscious skills and then you can practice that and improve your subconscious. Originally, when you were learning to read, your subconscious was not better than your conscious mind. When you're a little kid and you're first learning to read, you, you learn consciously. And with a lot of practice, you get used to it, and your subconscious catches up most of the way, but not quite all the way. But then, over time, you read subconsciously for years and years and years, and you stop doing much conscious reading or practice, so your conscious understanding gets worse, gets forgetful. And you end up with your subconscious actually being higher skill level because you've kept subconsciously reading every year, um, so that those skills aren't rusty, whereas your conscious reading skills get rusty. And also, there are important reading techniques and organizational techniques that you maybe never learned and were never good at. And so you need to work on consciously, intentionally using them and understanding how they work and stuff before you're going to be able to teach them to your subconscious. So those skills and techniques include things like understanding the grammar of what you read, which not everyone has ever studied. And the people who have studied it often didn't do a great job. So grammar is one thing. And then there's stuff like outlining and making trees and diagrams and flowcharts is another way of consciously, explicitly analyzing what's going on. Taking notes on what you read is another skill that can help make it more conscious and explicit. And a lot of people are not very good at note taking. Although some people practiced it a bunch during school and they got good at a particular type of note taking that was oriented towards passing school tests, but is maybe not super useful for your own understanding. And some people have actually been taking notes that they find personally useful for many years and are actually pretty decent at it. But the majority of people do not have very good note-taking skills currently. So there's two basic problems with subconscious reading. Like one, it's hard to improve, it's hard to make refinements to it. It is possible to just take your subconscious reading and make some little tweaks and make it better, but it's hard to do that and hard to know like what changes to make and how to fix any problems. It's hard to work with because it's all inexplicit and intuitive, so it's, it's hard to work with your intuitions and change them and stuff. A method with major advantages is to work with conscious ideas, and then you can figure out flaws in the conscious ideas and make changes to the conscious ideas and test out the changes and see how that works. And then when you're satisfied with them, you practice and make it habitual and automatized and subconscious. So when you're trying to evaluate which ideas are good and make tweaks to them, you're working with conscious ideas, which is easier. 
rather than trying to just directly work with the subconscious ideas to do that. And then another issue with subconscious ideas is they can be pretty hit or miss. So you try your subconscious approach and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't, you kind of just get stuck. Sometimes you have some sort of backup plan you can do subconsciously, like multiple different things you can try. And then if you try all of those and they don't work, then you got stuck. Whereas with conscious stuff, you can do more conscious problem solving and use some generic problem solving methods. So if you're able to work with stuff consciously, it can help you with problem solving. You can do things like brainstorming and writing down pro con lists and trying to free write about what the problem is or just doing critical and textual analysis consciously can help with problem solving. Whereas if it's all subconscious, you can have less control over the problem solving and fewer options, fewer steps you can take to try to get past the problem. So when you run into problems and don't understand things, a lot of what you want to do is break things into smaller parts. And that is the kind of thing that's easier to do as a conscious, intentional skill, rather than hoping your subconscious can do it. And then if you have done that consciously a lot and practiced it a lot and gotten good at it consciously, then your subconscious can get good at that and often do it for you and save time and effort. But if you've never been consciously really good at that, then your subconscious is probably not good at it either. So realistically, you need to consciously learn how to analyze things and break them down into parts before you can expect to ever be subconsciously good at it. When you're reading, your subconscious has to handle many, many little tasks, like finding the verbs in the sentences and figuring out what they mean, and then figuring out what words are connected to them, like the subject or the object, and then what that means, and then what are the modifiers, and for each modifier, what does that word mean, and what word is it modifying? So you have to be able to take the modifier and apply it to the thing it modifies. And so people are decent at this subconsciously if they're like a competent above average reader. But they make some mistakes. Sometimes their subconscious does one of those little tasks wrong. And so it's good if you can switch into conscious mode and do the same analysis at least as well as your subconscious could do it. It's good to have that as an alternative approach that's not especially hard or problematic for you. That you can consciously go through and figure out which, modif which words are modifiers, which phrases are modifiers, and what things do they modify. And when you first start doing that, you will probably make some mistakes in your conscious analysis that your subconscious analysis did not make. So when you read it just normally, there was some part that did not confuse you and you actually got it right and you were fine. But then when you try to do conscious analysis and make a tree or something, then you actually put it as the child of the wrong thing, as modifying the wrong word. And so there is a, a learning period, an adjustment period, as you try to get good at conscious analysis, where it has to catch up to your subconscious skill level before it can surpass your subconscious skill level. And in that temporary period where you're catching up, it's not especially useful. It can still be a bit useful, but you'll get more value from it in the future later. This stuff is very relevant to doing philosophy and debates and rational thinking and all that. To do that stuff, you need to be correctly reading what people say to you. You need to be correctly reading your own sentences, what you say. And that means things like knowing which modifiers apply to which words. If you're getting that wrong and you think that word not or maybe applies to a different word than it actually does, that is going to lead to misunderstandings and incorrect conclusions. If someone brings up three things and they say one of them is significant and you incorrectly identify which one is the significant one, that's a problem. You need to get the modifier right kind of a basic skill, but it needs to be reliable. If you're going to do advanced philosophy, you need to be able to read lots and lots of stuff while making very, very few mistakes like that. And when you do make a mistake like that, it should not be very hard for you to do a conscious analysis of the sentence or paragraph and get the correct answer and see what your mistake was and what happened and why you were wrong and then not be confused anymore. 
And so that is a thing that is not taught in schools, not even in like a uh, graduate school. People get PhDs without ever being any good at that, let alone doing elementary school. Like they're moderately good at it from school. Like when they read, they know which mod they know for modifiers what word it applies to correctly over 90% of the time. So it's like it's in some sense it's good. It's much better than random. And it lets them read a lot of stuff reasonably well. Like they can read a novel and know what the plot was. Their reading isn't so confused that they don't know the basic plot of the novel. But they get some details wrong. And then if you want to do philosophy, you need much higher quality understanding of all the little details and nuances. If you don't have that advanced a grasp of English and what words mean, then when you're trying to say a specific, detailed, advanced, clever concept, you're going to use words that do not accurately represent your thought. And people are not going to be able to fix that for you and guess what you mean. You have to become a better communicator who can use words in a more precise, exact way so that they better correspond to what you mean. Also, using words more precisely will help you have better concepts with fewer errors in them. But even if you got the concept right, sometimes you know, you're, you have the concept wrong, you've gotten the details wrong in your own mind, but sometimes your concept is actually okay, but then you communicate it wrong. And in both cases, better language skills is helpful. And then you need to read what other people say and not introduce lots of misunderstandings into your discussions. If you're having a misunderstanding every paragraph when you're reading, that is going to derail discussions. It's going to be a lot of distractions. If you can get that down to one misunderstanding every hundred paragraphs, that's going to be a lot less derailing, a lot less distracting. It's going to work a lot better. And then what if you want to have adversarial debates? You need a really low misunderstanding rate because those get derailed even more easily than more friendly or cooperative discussions. So if you're going to be able to debate people, you want to very rarely misread what they say so that when, when what they said is not wrong, you don't get it wrong. And when, when they say something that is wrong, that's confused in some way, you want to be able to notice that and say, aha, here's where one of your confusions is, here's where something's going wrong, here's an error you're making. And then you want the things you say in the debate to have a low error rate, so you're not frequently making a bunch of mistakes they can call out or get confused by without consciously recognizing. People have a lot of ideas about why debates are unproductive, and there are many, many causes, including tribalism and bias. But I think that just detail errors when reading, writing, communicating, and thinking about the concepts yourself makes a huge difference. All these tiny little small problems, because they're frequent, actually add up to a really big overall problem that makes it very, very hard to deal with advanced concepts successfully. It's related to misquoting, which I've been very against for a very long time, and I think quotes should just be exactly accurate, and you should have high quality and precision standards when you're quoting people. With quoting, it's especially important, because the issue is not just making mistakes, like the discussion gets confused or derailed. It is also, when you're quoting someone, you are putting words in their mouth. And if the words are exactly their own words without the slightest change, then that's okay. But if you're quoting them and you're screwing anything up, then it looks to people like that was their mistake, but it was actually your screw up. So you're putting these mistakes on other people and potentially harming their reputation or misleading people about those other people without their consent. Like they did not authorize you to speak for them they did authorize you to quote them. Quoting is a normal, accepted thing. But quoting for the privilege of being able to use other people's words and talk about what they said, in return for that privilege, you're required to get it exactly right and make no changes whatsoever. Unless you put them in square brackets, which is an allowed way to make like minor changes to clarify things. Like there are certain rules for what you can change, but other than those very few rules, you're not allowed to change anything. And anyways, I think people misquoting, sometimes it's disrespectful and rude on purpose or in some way, but a lot of the time it's just a little bit careless because they're a little bit sloppy. And it is the same kind of issue as 
being a little bit careless and sloppy at reading and making too many mistakes when reading and that kind of thing, I think, derails discussions and prevents people from ever being very great at things and doing the more advanced stuff. There's a lot of people who want to do clever stuff and advanced stuff and they get stuck and they get it wrong and it doesn't work and they don't know why and they think maybe they're just not smart enough and I think it's a large amount of that problem can be solved by building up lower level skills with higher quality standards and fixing many, many small errors and making them more reliable. And the more reliable you got all your basic underlying skills, the less you run into problems and the less they distract you and the more it frees up your conscious attention and energy to work on medium level stuff or advanced stuff. It's not the only major problem that a lot of people have to work on to become a great thinker, but it's one of a relatively small number of major problems that I think is really important to work on. Another one is like emotional or psychological problems where people have issues with motivation or procrastination or stuff like that. A lot of people need to put some kind of work into that and get better at being organized with how they use their time and scheduling things and prioritizing and stuff like that. A lot of people go through life in a bit of a subconscious habitual way and they need to be able to make some conscious choices about what they want to do with their life and their time and then actually uh, make changes so that they they follow through on that and it becomes subconscious and intuitive and stuff. So that is again related to taking something where your subconscious has some way it is unsatisfactory and then consciously figuring out something that you want to change to, something you think is better. And then once you get that working reasonably well with conscious analysis and control, then you practice, automatize, make your subconscious be able to do it. So you need to be able to do that with reading skills and also with managing your life skills, like managing your schedule. You should, if you want to work on that, spend some days where you consciously control your schedule and stop relying on your automizations and just keep consciously deciding what do I do next, what do I do next, and don't let your subconscious take over, don't go into autopilot mode. And if you do that for a week, you may have some trouble because your conscious mind is not actually as good at scheduling in some ways as your subconscious is. So there can be a learning curve there just to catch back up, just like with reading. But if you want to be able to improve, then having some conscious control over it and being able to do it well consciously is a good step. And then you can make some changes to how you do it when you're consciously controlling it, and then you can pass those changes on to your subconscious. And that is often better and more effective than trying to directly make changes in your subconscious without ever knowing what you're doing consciously. To a large extent, the people who are like smart or clever or impressive have some good automizations due to luck or skill or merit or whatever during childhood. And if you don't happen to have automizations that good right now, that is okay. In the long run, if you make a bunch of progress, it doesn't matter that much. If you consciously build your skills and then start automatizing those things, it doesn't make that much difference how good your subconscious automizations currently are. As long as you're able to get started and make progress, then you're going to be able to make more progress and more progress. And having a little bit of a head start on some of the subconscious stuff doesn't make a huge difference to where you end up in 10 years. Whereas if you're not making much conscious progress, then the head start makes a big difference. If everyone's kind of stuck, then the people with a bit of a head start, they're a bit smarter now and they stay a bit smarter because no one's changing. All right, good luck. I hope that's helpful. Bye bye.